Sorry for the delay, everybody. Ladies and gentlemen, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today for the Web 2016 Business Leadership Series, Learn to Lead. Every year during Web University Development brings together feature, uh, uh, prominent business leaders and speakers from around the region. These individuals have been instrumental in shaping the business outlook within the kingdom and beyond. And this year we've been able to bring three exciting speakers. Today is the third lecture in our series. And today we have with us one of the first few Saudi females to receive her license from the Saudi government to practice law. She was the first Saudi to serve as a fellow for the UNAOC, that's the United Nations Alliance of Civilizations. She was also the first Middle Eastern participant to join the Amsterdam School of Creative Leadership program. Since 1999, She's been serving as a legal consultant for Hussam Wagfi Law Office, the Mishari Al Ghazali Law Firm, and as, as a legal advisor at the Comparative Arab Law for the Quraysh Institution for Law and Policy in Kuwait. That's a mouthful. Uh, she's also the founder and CEO of Tashkil. It's a Saudi based social enterprise that incubates, accelerates, and promotes creative entrepreneurs. She founded Kayan Space, <laughs> if I'm saying that correctly. Yes. Yeah a membership-based community that provides office space for entrepreneurs and freelancers. In 2011, she was chosen to participate in the Harvard Executive Program titled Leading for the Future, the Arab Region in a Changing World, where she represented Tashkil's socioeconomic cycle as an ecosystem for social change and development. She has received her bachelor's degree in law and a master's degree in Islamic law from Cairo University also received an MBA from the American University of Technology. She holds numerous positions on boards and is also an active writer on women's rights, social values, and interreligious dialogue. We're truly fortunate to have someone of this caliber, and I'd like all of you to give her a warm, couched welcome to Ms. Safana Dahlan. Um, can you hear me? Um, I'm, I'm very honored to be in KAUST because I've always viewed KAUST as a hub for innovation and a stepping stone to change in the kingdom. And for me to be here today um, is, is really an honor and it's also a validation that what I have been doing for the past five years got me to KAUST to speak in Kels, so I would like to thank you all. Um, people wonder when they hear my bio, you know, what does law have to do with creativity? Well, I, I was one of those people. I mean, I stumbled into creativity by chance. It was not, it, I was not one of those people that plan her path at all. I was, uh, you can say, uh, we have a term in, in Arabic, it says uh, a, craft, a craftsman of many, a uh, craftsmanship is a master of nine. So that's how my parents viewed me. I was good in many things, but I really never had a focus on something that I wanted to do. Unlike my brother, who always knew he was going to be a lawyer. He always knew that he was going to Harvard. He always knew he was going to London, to live in London. So he had things really clear right there, and I was just all over, all over the place. Now, what I didn't know about myself, that I was always driven by motive, and I always, uh, I always navigated my calling. And my presentation today, or my talk today, was is really to share with you a lot of my mistakes <laughs> and not really oh my god these planned uh, very focused thing but it was really mistakes and my choices of what to do with these situations uh, I'll take you a little bit back uh, when I when I when I decided to study law it was just um, um, I was I was faced with I, I encountered a um, situation for a woman who was married to a wealthy man. Uh, she was at that time 17 years old. He was 70 years old. And 
and uh, she happened to live in the neighborhood. And one day, I heard her story that her uh, the son, uh, the, his children from a different wife, kicked her out of the house after his death. And for some reason, as I was a 16-year-old, I felt that, you know, we need to fight for the rights of this woman, and this woman she should take justice. But then I learned that the system was not, um, was not structured for this woman to get her rights because of many gaps that people used against her. So I really, I said, okay, then, you know what, I need to study law. I need to know who gives these people rights. So I graduated, I went to Cairo University, I told my dad that I wanted to study law, and he welcomed the idea because he believed at one point in Saudi Arabia, women will partake in the judicial realm, although it was impossible back in 95 to think that women will become lawyers. Uh, I graduated from Cairo University, and being in a Cairo University, how many of you know Cairo University, or at least have an insight of what is Cairo University. Okay, so from a private school to Cairo University. So for me, it was just like, it's not just overwhelming, it's a cultural shock right there. But I've learned to, to develop my street smart. <laughs> I've learned to see reality. I've seen poverty right in its face. I've seen the determination. I've seen resilience. I've seen diversity. I started being exposed to a lot of things. And I struggled from an A student to barely passing. Actually, I failed the first year. I failed all my subjects. Not because I didn't study, because the exams were outdoor in the open air, and it was in the middle of August, and I wasn't used to heat. So I was just so focused on the heat that I couldn't write. Once, that, once I graduated, I went to the, I wanted to come back to Saudi Arabia because, you know, now I'm a lawyer, I have lessons to, you know, nobody should talk to me. Uh, at least I went to the consulate to get it validated or uh, accredited, and they said, we're sorry, we can't do that. I'm like, why? And they said, uh, because there's no colleges offering that in Saudi Arabia, which is why we cannot uh, uh, recognize your certificate. So I asked them, what, do you, what can I do now? They said, you need to study Sharia. That's the only course that is, you know, where you can have less hours and all. So um, I, I, want to, I said to my dad, okay, so he's like, you don't have options. This is your choice from the beginning. So the options were uh, to study Sharia, and you can think, I was a 17 year old, all my friends were in the States, you know, having these amazing pictures in amazing campuses, and I was going to uh, go to Azhar to study Sharia. So <laughs> we were driving in the car, and when I arrived to Azhar, my dad with me, so he knows somebody there, so I was like, oh my God, I forgot my Tarha. <laughs> And he's like, how are you going to get in there? I was like, well, he's like, there's no way back. Which is manage, your, manage yourself. So I went there, and the guy, the, the, the sheikh of Azhar, who's the, he was in the, yeah, the, pres the president of the university, was like, why do you want to study Sharia? Uh, I said, well, I want to study Sharia because, you know, all the situation. I explained it to him. And then he looked at me and he's like, but you are not covered. And for that minute, I don't know. I mean, I think I, think I was inspired by something. So I said, well, uh, I didn't know that Azhar was the gate to heaven, or else I would have came covered. I actually, <laughs> I, I came to Azhar to, be, um, to have hidayah. What is hidayah in English? Yes, so to be enlightened and uh, guidance. So he's like, Lim Zayabit, which mm -hmm. means that you are an argumentative lady, and we will accept you uh, with a prerequisite of memorizing four, verse, four chapters of Quran and coming next month to perform it. What I didn't know then, that my studying Sharia was the most enlightening thing I have ever done, and it was one of my best investments in my time, in my life, in my health, in everything. 
Because what happened in Azhar, I studied all the school of thoughts. I studied all religions. I started understanding the wisdom behind creation and behind spirituality. I also studied Islamic art and architecture. And being in Egypt and knowing that I'm a visual person, I started going to the mosques. So I started looking at all these arches and details. And I was always wondering, I'm like, you know, all these people, where did they go? What, where did this DNA go? I mean, today you hire a painter and you stay ages. It's like Merlot, uh, it's like uh, one of these people that come into your house and never leave because he cannot perfect what you want. Where did this DNA go? And I started finding a correlation between two things, between the, fundament, the, fu the foundation of Islamic economy, which is built on recognizing a, the, the uh, uh, personal properties, al-milkiyya al-khasla, and considering the cooperation and collaboration and community service. But then I also noticed that then there is leadership and there are patrons that knew the value of art and creativity within the society. Not from an economical point of view, not at all, but more from a uh, cultural and from a social point of view. So that, in the background, graduated from Sharia. I still wanted to help women, and I still wanted to go to courts, and I still wanted to do all that. Faced with another obstacle after I graduated, they said, okay, Sharia is good now, this chapter is good, but there is a one problem. I was like, what's the problem? They're like, you didn't have a male um, uh, guardian companionship, a mahram. I was like, yeah, well, you never told me to get a mahram. They're like, well, you know, the new law says that you need to have mahram when you're studying Sharia. So for years, I was not recognized, not with even my masters from Azhar, where all the men who were my colleagues, the Saudi ones, were recognized. That led me to work as a legal consultant in the back offices, um, begging people to hire me, both in Egypt, until I got an opportunity in Citibank in Lebanon to work there. This is where I started uh, saying, you know, I might be shifting careers, you know. But that environment helped me understand that the, the, the whole idea of finance and trading and how the financial system works. And I said, okay, great. So this is how it's going to work. I did an MBA. And, and then I, was, I moved to Kuwait. I was hired to work in a legal firm. This legal firm, they, they said, okay, she speaks English, she has a foundation of Sharia, uh, why don't you handle our international department uh, dealing with entertainment industry? And so all my cases were in copyright for writers, music, music, musicians, artists. But what I've noticed is a lot of the cases that we started having were cases that uh, Said that was that the artist or the, the creative person was always the person who was abused, and it just didn't make sim sense to me. Why does why are all these people who are creative always signing contracts that was not fair for them? So I I asked my boss to handle these cases not through litigation but actually through uh, arbitration um, mediation. And you know, as a mediator, yes, it takes a long time. It makes more money for the company, which they're happy. But what was good is you always have two happy clients. And having happy clients, I have made a lot of friends who were in the creative industry. They started inviting me more and more. And one day, uh, I was invited by a friend who told me, Sufana, why don't you do a workshop on how to read the contract? That's great. Uh, when I gave that workshop, it failed miserably. Oh, I forgot to move the presentation. Um, 
So basically, I was in a beautiful, it was my dream job. I had a beautiful office, marble desk, swivel chair, you know, what I thought to be as a lawyer. And then I just, honestly, I didn't feel satisfied in any, in any way. Because um, there was a problem that can be solved from the beginning and it was never solved. So I took the idea of doing the workshop and I, started, I did the first workshop and it failed miserably, literally. Why? I applied what I've, this is wrong. Yeah, so maybe I should use this one. I moved my, yeah. So it failed miserably because after two minutes of explaining law the way I learned it in, in university, these people were on their mobiles, literally. They didn't even look at me. I, I jumped, I moved, that's it, I lost them from the first second. So I went to a friend of mine and I said, uh, you know what, there's something wrong with these people. They don't, only, they, don't, they don't understand law, but they also don't understand, uh, they don't understand me. So what she said, Sufana, the problem is not in them, it's in you. You're explaining law to people who are visual. You're supposed to transform the content into something interesting. So she gathered a group of artists and designers and they started illustrating my workshop. So consignment became this girl that is carrying a bag that is not hers and all that. And when I gave that workshop, it went from 15 people to 50. The next summer, I did it six times. Each class had 20. And then I did, after two summers, I was like, you know what, this is great business. Why not leave my job and open this as a business? So, uh, thinking of what will I call my company that will teach people how to read their contracts and to support them in business and legal matters, uh, I stumbled on an article that was talking about innovation. It was talking about the Arabic script from an innovative point of view. And this article described the tashkil, which is the diacritics, you know, the little signs on top of the Arabic word. And it was saying that with the spread of Islam and having all these sects coming in with different dialects, the, the pronunciation of Arabic was very, were being very, like it varied. So they wanted you to unite that pronunciation. So imagine, it's a problem right there. Now, if in today's world, when we have such a problem, what are we going to do? You know, demolish the building, build another building. Abandon Jeddah and come, come to uh, King Abdullah Economic City. So it's just moving things. It's not solving the initial problem that we have. But our ancestors knew better what is innovation. They knew better what is design. They designed a little sign, little sign. And this sign gave the Arabic world not only it solved the problem of uniting diversity, but it also res respected diversity. And it also gave our script such a beautiful element that is, that is now used in art. It made it so beautiful, it enriched it. And for me to believe that this is the philosophy of our innovation, this is why I called my company Tashkil. And with the Tashkil, each, uh, each Tashkil has something we call harakat, like a, a, a little, uh, you know, the, 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 the vowels, basically. So Fatha inspired me to create workshops from Fataha, Fatah Uqul, opening minds and opportunities for these creatives. Where Dhamma inspired me to gather, to gather these creatives, because Dhamma literally means gathering. So gather these creative through different platforms, whether it's events, whether it's exhibition, and whether it's communication, and connecting them to the world. <coughs> where, um, Where Kesra means breaking, so breaking these obstacles in the face of these designer in order for them to, um, to accelerate. And 
enable them to create businesses in order to fulfill a complete ecosystem. And so with each one of these harakat, which in Arabic means dynamics, we, were, we started adopting our philosophy and building our socio-economic model, where we gather all these talents in order to fill a whole uh, ecosystem in the creative industry. That said, I, I, I opened in Beirut with a small fund from the EU to incubate 20 designers. We did that in six months. We did a big exhibition. We sold the stuff. And we had a deal with these designers to give us a certain commission in order for us to incubate another five designers. When we incubated the five designers, 2011, there was an, a political issue. People were not buying in Lebanon. So we start, I started uh, doing like, I said, OK, so what is happening today? What's happening today, my observation is as simple as this analogy. I see, I saw big designers, like big airplanes, lined up in a runway, and they're all taking off. But they're taking off opportunities. They're taking off the funds from the angel investors or VCs. They're taking off all the media spaces. They're taking off all the uh, exhibition spaces. And for me, I was like, OK. But I looked on the side. I saw small designers, little designers, who had great potential. But they were not able to take off because they, there's no space for them in this ecosystem. So what I decided to do is to create a parallel platform for them to take off. In Beirut, it worked perfectly because the ecosystem was complete. Was, there was production, there were manpower, the university creativity levels were high. I didn't have a problem, really. All what I had to do is direct them to opportunities. Uh, you can go in Kuwait. There is this exhibition I call this person. Uh, I called my friends to make open houses for these designers. But what happened in Saudi, when this was so successful, I thought, you know what, let's open markets in Saudi Arabia. I came to Saudi Arabia in 2012 with no business plan, which is a huge mistake, with no proper studying of the market, with just so much passion to help creatives. And so what happened to me is that I built the runway right away with all these ideologies that I had in mind. But then I realized, oh my god, it's a desert. Not an analogy. In reality, the, the desert, there was no ecosystem. As an entrepreneur, I was choking. There, there's no space for me. I just wanted to do a commercial license where I practiced what I was doing in Beirut. And they said, OK, you have these boxes. Which one do you fit in? I'm like, OK, I'm a little bit the I.O. Erlan, which is advertising. But I'm a little bit also event management. I'm a little bit, uh, you know, this and that. And he said, no, you need to choose one. I'm like, I can't choose one. He's like, OK, then I have an idea for you. You need to open five sigillat tijaria, five commercial license. I said, OK. So I did have the five commercial license. Little did I know, I had to do five accounting five zakat, five everything, which doubled the trouble, literally. And being an entrepreneur, you are capitalizing on sweat equity. So I would ask this accountant to do this commercial license, and this accountant, this commercial license, and, and beg here and there for people to finish some work, and go to universities and big accounting students to finish a little bit of that. But then. I said, OK, you know what? Maybe I did a big mistake. It's time for me to recap and pick and pack and go to Beirut. This is where I remember my mom's words. She always said, may God give you uh, what Allah yatika ala good niyatik. May God give you um, as per your intentions. And I started thinking of what was my intention when I came here. When I came to Saudi Arabia, my intention was really to help creatives. It wasn't really to have to implement the same business model that worked in Beirut. This wasn't really the case. I came 
with the intention to help them. So I said, okay, we'll stay. So when I stayed, I said, okay, what can we do now? I, I'm choking, but let me try to help what I can help. What, what was funny is people started coming to me because I was the only hub that was more social, that was not elitish. It was very underground movement. And so they started coming to me and I thought they would take off. You know, I just, oh, I did the runway, yalla. Let's, why don't you guys take off? You know, the people in Beirut just took off. But I discovered they had different problems. The little airplanes in Beirut had tires, had pilots. They knew how to drive the plane. Things were good. They just needed a runway. Whereas the designers in Saudi, people didn't have pilots. They didn't have co-pilots. They didn't have tires. They didn't have gas, which is motivation for me. I'll tell you a story. There was this guy who was a security in one of the universities. He knocked our door and he said, you know, I have a passion for fashion design. I said, great, come, let's look at what you have. He was very talented that we directly took him into developing his business plan. Six months after developing his business plan, I mean, working and with him to develop his business plan, I, I, was, I got a very surprisingly a, a visitor. Uh, they told me that there's a lady waiting for you outside. I go outside and I find his mother screaming. She's like, I spend all my life wishing for my son to become a security in this university and now you want him to become a tailor? And I said, he's not a tailor, he is a fashion designer. She's like, no, how can I go and propose to people? I go, do I say he's a khayat? And I said, okay. I said, Khalti, you know, you know the, like, uh, you know, back then, all our families were khayat, najjar, were all, you know, craftsmanship. That's why they called them families. So she's like, please, you, you're talking nonsense. Do not come next to my son. I will really had alayk if kul salah will curse you in every prayer. This is when I realized our problem is cultural. Our problem is mindset. And I was like, what can I do now? I mean, it's <laughs> one thing is the designers need to be equipped, but the other thing is after equipping them, if they are going to be faced by people who are going to push them back, so what are we going to do? So we started saying, okay, let's move on. Let's keep doing the workshops. Let's keep doing some events where we can get the mothers, little by little, engaged in our events and playing with their minds. So we managed to, in five years, to accelerate um, with our own way of acceleration, 50 designers, from fashion to graphics to um, uh, you name it, you name it. And we managed to host 60 events under the radar, which means no Amara Tasrih. <laughs> there are only few that had Amara, which is online. You can view them on our YouTube, but the rest of them were undercover. We've managed to have 18,000 guests coming to our underground events. That showed me that the society is changing that the sales of our pop-up stores from 20% to 120%, we had three times refills. There is something changing. There are people that want change. So what we did, I said, okay, so there is some, something happening. How can I get more help? I started calling people in the community. I started telling people, can you help me uh, coach two artists? Can you help me coach to designer, can you come on Saturday and mentor these people? Can you uh, design the logo of this artist? He's almost going to be out of our, uh, you know, acceleration, and he needs a logo. And I found out the community are willing to help. And I went back to the reason why they want to help. It's their intention. I discovered people have good intention, whether they were individual, whether they were organizations, whether it is the government. They just don't know what to do. And so we, gathering that big community, 
I started saying, okay, so now what does Tashkil need to do? So we were doing workshops and now other people are doing the same thing. And we also <laughs> did the events and our events are becoming popular. We also managed to tap into the angel investors. We also did start, we took the concept of crowdfunding from online to offline. So what we did is we started teaches, teaching our designers, like fashion designer, like how many members of your family do you have? She's like, well, I have this number. I'm like, can you get friends of your friends? She's like, yeah. I'm like, yalla, we're doing an event. Put your collection and let's pre-sell it. So she designed her collection and she pre-sell it. She gets the money and she starts buying the resources that will create her first collection. Then we place her into one of our events, Ramadan Bazaar. But we never say that this is a new designer that we incubated. We merge her with the other people. And we see how her products are be is, being, is, is performing within the market. If it performs well, she's out of our accelerator. If it's not, we bring her back and see what we're doing wrong. It could be pricing. It could be we're not understanding her target, uh, target market. After, uh, after five years, I always thought that my KPI or my definition of success is to have a six digit number in the bank parked. That never happened. <laughs> uh, it's not that we didn't have this income. It's that we didn't, we, were, we always spent the income on other projects. So one of the projects that we, start, we did without even noticing was when our service designers, like interior designers, started asking us favors to use our meeting rooms, and we have one meeting room then, I started getting frustrated because I can't hold my meeting and these people, I can't say, you know, you over, you, you're abusing my kindness. So we decided to do the first co-working space. We opened the co-working space in 2011 under the name of Creative Space. Six months after, uh, one of the members of the co-working space uh, took a picture and there were girls in the picture, you know, boys and girls, but not, not in a bad, I you mean, know, they're just there. And tagged us, no, not tagged us, he put a pin and social media, he just put the location. I got a visit from the Hay'a, and they knocked the door and they said, we're looking for this place. So thank God it was 8 p.m. and we were closed. So the, the, the guard said, uh, do you know this place? And he called me. He's like, you know, the hate is coming in the morning. I said, what, so what did they say? He's like, he showed me a picture of the space. So I called the team at 12 a.m. after midnight, and I said, we're taking all the furniture out now. <laughs> and we emptied the whole space and put it in the yard of my parents' house. And so the hate came in the morning, and they said, we're looking for this place. I'm like, my space doesn't have furniture. And he said, what do you mean? I, it's here. I'm like, you know how technology fool you? Of course it's not here. <laughs> and so I had to close and rebrand so that it, it was all camouflage, Saraha. And um, that co-working space was one of the best things that happened. Because having a space is having a home for creative people. They started coming in. <coughs> working together. I saw projects collaborating and coming out of there. I've seen people started offering each other bartering services. I've also seen people knocking doors and they say, we would like to help. And it actually showed me that when you have a hub and when you have a space and when you have resilience, you're able to really ignite a movement. So today, I started saying, okay, uh, we have people already knowing how to do pop-up stores. There are people also doing some uh, workshop. We have galleries, we have, we have. What, is sh what should Tashkil do? And we looked at the asset that we have gained and we have gained a big network. We also have gained a lot of expertise. So we decided to design and develop programs that will <coughs> enable us to uh, build the airport to complete the ecosystem. And one of the projects that we're working on is the Saudi National Creative Initiative. We started working on that project in 2013. 
looking at doing a market research, we wanted to map the creative industry in uh, Saudi Arabia. We traveled to over uh, 20 cities in Saudi Arabia to explore what type of creativity that they have. And we said, okay, we need a market research, so let's pick a random sample in Shata area, and we picked certain district, and we started knocking doors and asking a uh, very simple question. Do you have a creative or anybody who has creativity in your house? 80% <coughs> of the people who answered the door, uh, other than the nannies, were <laughs> saying that, um, no, we don't. Alhamdulillah, I have a doctor. I have a, I have a son that works in Kaust. I have a daughter that is in Jamaat al Malik Abdelaziz. I have a person in the bank. And I'm like, okay, why did she say Alhamdulillah as if it's a disease? You know, I'm not Ebola. I'm, I'm asking about, do you have a creative person in the house? So <laughs> I was like, you know, guys, I went to my team. I'm like, this is not going to work. You know, people, uh, people do not recognize creativity as a profession or as an income generating profession. They think that creativity is a hobby. And this is why when you ask them, they're, they're, they're shutting the door. So I said, no, they said, okay, halas, let's stop. You know, now I said, no, of course not. You know, this is even, this is, this is a new game for me. And I said, okay, so let's try to find something else. What is, my analogy was, what is the piece of sugar that I put then all the ants will come to me instead of me knocking the doors. And it's a random, it's a random sample. It's not, for those of you who are researcher, I mean, I'm not biased. I just exhibit and say, you know, this is my sugar, where are the ants? So the ants will come. And I looked at what we know about the characteristic of a creative person in the Middle East. And one of them is that he is uh, very passionate. He's like a little boy who loves football and wants to know everything about, is he Messi? M Messi or Messi? Or I don't know about Messi. Okay, so he, he, he knows where is his house. He actually, he, he Google map his house. He knows what's the name of the wife, how many children. So the creative person is the same way. And then what we did is we, in 2013, uh, we got four experts that are not very, very famous, but they're, uh, they're known in the, in the creative community uh, that are in the fa somehow in the fashion industry to give workshops. And one of them was Fred Butler, who was Lady Gaga's accessory designer, uh, Carmen Malvar, who designed the retail stores of Zara, um, uh, the, the person who designs the window displays of Selvridge, and we exhibited in Tashkil Instagram only. I was hoping that we actually have uh, 30 women. That was my hope. We actually had 86 women. We didn't know where to put them. This is how packed it was. Now, what's funny is that we have already announced that the price was 3,000 riyal. So I didn't want to back up and say, no, it's not 3,000, because I, I just said 30 people, 3,000, cover my cost, I'm happy. But when, when we had this number, we were shocked. We took that uh, with all its finding and we started working on something called the Saudi National Creative Initiative. This initiative aims to map the creative industry in Saudi Arabia using four pillars or four activities. One of which the, uh, the pillar of communication which is the digital platform of, of Sensi. It's an online platform where where it's going to serve as a directory for Saudi creative or creatives that lives in Saudi Arabia, connect them with opportunities, connect them with, uh, calen uh, with events, uh, enable them to showcase their stuff, enable them to promote their services. The second pillar <coughs> is the Saudi Creative Week. See, how can I promote my platform? You know, I need an event. And the event is the Creative Weeks. We did the first pilot and the second pilot. The third pillar is the report. Are we, are we losing time? No, good. The third pillar is the report. Uh, I went back to my, log my legal hat without me knowing. And that is, when I gathered these data, I found out that this data is my evidence to build a case to lobby for these people. 
One of the things that I lobbied for was against the Ministry of Labor. It's not really a court case. It's, re it's really very uh, peaceful lobbying. <laughs> so what we did is after the first pilot, when we did the digital fabrication and furniture design, we discovered that, our fir first of all, there's not a single <coughs> university that offers furniture design. The second thing we've discovered that a lot that people flew from different parts of the kingdom to attend it, which is an extra expense for them. And the third thing we discovered that Saudiization killed the potential of this sector. And so I sent my I sent my finding in a letter to the uh, minister of labor. And I said, you know what, your decision has this effect on these people. What are you going to do about it? So I received an email. He said, can I come and visit? <laughs> and so he came and visit. And we had all these designers sitting there explaining how when Saudiization happened, a lot of carpenters left the kingdom. And a lot of the designs of these people were lost. And that they could, till today, they couldn't really copyright any of their drawings, you know. <coughs> Again, we found the loophole for that, but we, and now they can actually resist it, but it was interesting to see that there is a cooperation from the government, whereas I was so biased, I'm like, oh, they're never going to help us, you know, nobody's going to listen to us, but they did. In the second pilot, we wanted to test our operations, and I wanted to test the factor, would uh, mobility be an obstacle for women to come and attend our event. And so we called Karim, uh, uh, the, serv the car service, and we said, can you sponsor us and give us the codes? And you know, not many women, I'm sure women have drivers, or, but just give me the codes. And they said, okay. And in the advertising and media weed week pilot, uh, I discovered something very interesting that the people who came to attend the video edi editing workshop, 90% of the women used Kareem. And this did not make sense to me. I mean, I started looking, is it school hours? Is the, is the drivers busy? I mean, what's going, why? We looked at the pick up and drop up point at Kareem, and we saw that these people came from south of Jeddah. They came from neighborhoods that are very humble. Although when, we, when you sit in the workshop, you will never recognize that. They put so much effort to, be, to merge. That made me understand. And when we asked them, why do you want to study video editing? They were smart enough to know that there is potential to work in this field. For us, these findings create the core of change and policy making for the creative industry in Saudi Arabia. It also enables opportunities for universities to uh, expand their curriculum. It gives opportunities, a lot of um, um, investment opportunities, because we found out in the fashion pilot that we, around uh, 60 designers that came, fashion designers that came, produced in Dubai. And they spent over 125,000 riyal. They spend it in Dubai between production and shipment. Which means that this is a huge, this, they do minimum designer does two collections a year. If not four, some of them do four collections. And this is a huge investment opportunity. If, if, if a businessman was smart enough, he can do one small factory with different line of production, have all these women produce in Saudi Arabia, open jobs for others, and that's right there. It's just in front of us, and we're just ignoring it. Our women are all, all our designers are, are migrating, whether they're migrating with the opportunities or with our incomes or with themselves, but they're all migrating. <coughs> How can we bring them back if we are not going to start with little steps of, of change? Today, the Saudi National Initiative after a long struggle to get visas for 40 experts, which we managed to get it with what we call Pahlawa, Street Smart, uh, we were supported by over 50 small businesses 
I was not supported by any large company. I was supported by 50, over 50 small companies. We have over 100 volunteers in three cities. These volunteers were trained by the AUB on project management. So today, these volunteers can become an institution to provide uh, event management. Not, they cannot only serve Sensi, they, they are going to serve other people. We, we also notice that we're sending a lot of documents out, whether it's agreements to experts, whether it's sponsorship kits, whether it's so many things. And so what we discovered, we said, okay, this is a great opportunity. Why should we put the logo? Hell with the logo. Let's get artists donate their work and give it to us, give us the right to use it. So all our documents for Sensi today is supporting an artist. Each and every single document is supporting an artist. That said, with all these volunteers, people come with their ideas. They come with their spirit. They come with their with new ideas. So the program itself started shaping up in a way I've never noticed before. One of the things that happened just recently, one of the volunteers who was a photography volunteer said, I want to take you somewhere. I said, okay, but I'm too busy. He's like, no, you cannot be busy for that. And he took me to Sharafia district, to a very tiny, tiny apartment. And when I went there, I said, where is that? I, to be honest, I was a little bit scared of my security. And I started saying, you know, my mom is right. I'm too jaria. I'm too courageous. I, I shouldn't really, I'm, I always put myself in trouble. But then I was like, okay, let's see where this is getting. I called the driver. I'm like, can you stand downstairs? I went up and we end, an old man opened the door and when we sat there, I said, who's he? And he said, this is one of the oldest photographers in Saudi Arabia. He is the founder of Beit al the photography house that was funded by Mohammed Saeed Farsi that I personally never knew about. This house was in old Jeddah. It was a hub for, for, people, to, for people to teach photography in the 60s. That said, I sat with that man and I learned that because we don't have a lead, naqabat, this guy has no health insurance. This guy, nobody knows about him. Not only that, an institution came to him and said, can you give us, you know, you know, long time ago there was the negative in small slides, like square slides. So this, uh, somebody came to him and said, you know, give me that and I will publish it and, and we will give you 700,000 riyal. And the poor man was so happy to get the 700,000, so he gave him everything without signing anything. He said, I lost my, all my life and all what I saw and what I wanted to leave behind, I don't know where is it. And nobody knows me. I cannot claim that I was a photographer. All what you know is, you, there is he showed me a piece of paper where when they founded this, this space. And so that young man who took me there said, I think the initiative is, should be not only about talking about the future and how we are going to change things and help, but if we are not going to recognize the past and the people who paved the way for us, I don't think we should really look into the future. We should really take by their hands and take, let them help us shape the future. And so now we're actually launching an honorary award for all these people that shaped creativity in Saudi Arabia. That said, what I want to leave you with is that sometimes you have crazy ideas and there is no way that you think is they're gonna happen. I mean, logically, there's no means. But I don't think this is a reason for you not to start. <coughs> start anywhere. You never know how your intention will gather all these people that believe in the same cause because they are there. There are people that believe in this cause. And you, you're going to see that you just need to be patient. I mean, it really took five years. And then so many times, there it's a very dark tunnel. Like, it's an extremely dark tunnel. It was dark tunnel when the Hay'a was interrogating me for three hours. And my father swore that he's going to take the family name out of my name <laughs> because of me hosting events that are not licensed. But 
I had a good intention, and I believe I have a good intention, and I think I can argue that with anyone who denies me, like the right to help these people. Uh, they are they are just a group of society. There are many people that people help. Uh, so that's the Saudi National Creative Initiative. And when people ask me, what does Tashkil do again? I always say, what we do is we design the future. And I don't do it alone. I, I really don't do it alone. I do it with a lot of people. A lot of people that their names are not out there. It happens to be that my name is out there because she's a Saudi lawyer and the first Saudi lawyer and it's very attractive to the media. But there are other people that did a lot of work. So I will show you some of what we do in video so that you can get a feel of it and open the door for questions if there is time. How much time is left? Yeah, we, we still have some time. Uh, and then we have more time down at the web hub. So okay. uh, how, so long is the we, how, how long is the video? Uh, uh, the video is not is not. Just to much. give a sense to the people that it's, it's like not going to be. Two minutes. All right, yeah. So I'll show you a couple of videos. But I'll also show you, how do we, okay. So um, I'll show you some of the sectors we're covering this year. Is there a, uh, this year we managed to convince four key people to come into Saudi Arabia despite the political situation where we spent hours convincing them. We're going to be tackling these sectors from creative innovation, initiative, social innovation, architecture, press and publication, visual art, media application, craftsmanship, tourism. Names like Reem Khouri, who was one of the major people in Aramex, who now fund, started her own consultancy. Um, Wajha, who are giving a workshop on bringing hope through design. So they're talking about accessibility design. How can we design things for people who are disabled? Uh, Niqat, who uh, have a very big forum every year. Uh, Aurelie, she's a TEDx speaker, so she's giving workshops on storytelling. Chris, uh, Lewis, uh, Michael Zappa, an amazing person who was, I think, at KAUST or was coming to KAUST. This, uh, this person is just exceptional. So people from Brazil, from the United States, are all coming. I, um, Mike Robinson, the guru of uh, BBC cartoons, uh, who has kids under the age of five? Okay, do you know Peppa Pig? Yes. Okay, she is the one behind Peppa Pig. <laughs> um, and of course, Leila, who did Sawga. Sawga is an amazing, amazing initiative that was funded by Khalifa Fund and she's giving a workshop on heritage marketing. So with all these names, these are some of the artists that said, Sufana, you can take my art. And you know how hard it is to convince the artist to give you a painting? It's like taking a piece of his heart. So all these artists donated their art for the initiative. Um, the video, I think I might need technical support. Yeah. I'll show you, uh, this is the Media and Advertising Week. You're going to see how
Crafts and um, I'm what they call a, a media, freelance media consultant these days, having spent very many years in television and specifically in animation. I, I think that part of what I do in my life now is about mentoring and is about actually looking after new and young talent that's coming along because actually it's very difficult for people who are creative and who want to join the party when no one knows them and they don't really know what to do. So from my point of view, I absolutely love being able to be part of a process that will, in the end, hopefully gain some great new talent for the business. Um, my name is Patrick Kisne and I'm a visual artist. I specialize in creative imaging technique. I've been approached by, by SNC to, to do these workshops here and I accepted it because it's interesting to, it's always interesting for me to teach um, the skills I have and um, share my know-how. And well, that's one of the motivations um, behind learning new things um, because if I can't share it, it doesn't make much sense. And if I can share it with people, um, that's really exciting. Keep up the great work and keep up organizing these workshops. I believe that hopefully someday this will help um, to, to transform creative industry in Saudi Arabia. For example, if you take other countries uh, like uh, UK, for example, um, most of the uh, of the money or the financial stability is from the creative industry, like all the uh, universities, all the creative fields, uh, the productions. Uh, this is how they attract a lot of students to you, to London, to UK, all over. Uh, this is how they attract a lot of production houses, a lot of media. Uh, uh, out. So this is a very important thing for economy as well and uh, to establish this market this proves like just what they did in some even the in the work, Gulf in the like workshops like that was done by some of the um, people who attended so section, like you can see that they have a high level of creativity really believing in these even in products that they did not use in Saudi Arabia, so they were given a brief about a cheese in Lebanon, or so, and you can see that they they really uh, uh, know they were actually acting in order to animate it and make it a cartoon. So they were really having fun. To just have a constructive plan, like the one that is happening now with Sensi, uh, because now it's the first step of the program, and they have other plans coming uh, after, if it's just get the right support, then I think uh, this will build a very good market for, uh, for a new industry. You can see the rest of our videos on Tishkeel, uh, YouTube, all the pop-up stores and all the portfolio reviews and so on. I thank you very much for your patience to listen to me today and I hope to see you soon in one of our events. Thank you so much, Mr. Fana. It was really inspiring, very interesting. Uh, I mean, I want to say once more, accomplished lawyer, an expert at Sharia, right? Uh, and, and, and a passionate, avid supporter of uh, creative industries. You're, a, you're an advocate, almost an activist, I would say. It's been an interesting journey, and we'd love for you to stay longer. Uh, we're going to open it up for questions for, real, for a short period, and then we'll take questions down at the web hub. I'm pretty sure everybody knows about that. That's at the end of the uh, hallway. So if we have questions, let's uh, start on that right away. Any questions? You're going to okay. me to the hub, okay? Somebody <laughs> wants to save their question for the, <laughs> for the hub, that's fine. Anybody else? Before we just wrap up, I know probably uh, everybody's got to go. We have one question down there.
Funny enough, it's not the same shape. Every uh, dynasty had a different shape. And uh, they, there are many different uh, school of thoughts about it. But a lot of it is to point out to the sky, you know, to Allah. And uh, they believe that arches are always a great way for uh, energy and, um, and uh, circulations. So if you look closely, and that's what I've never noticed, I just saw arches, but when you look closely, you will find different dynasty had different arches. Even the flower and the star that we always see in Islamic architecture is different from one dynasty to the other. You should Almost. really go to, uh, to Egypt and just text me. I'll give you a great guide that can show it to you from an architecture point of view. Thank, Thank you. you for the question. Almost a trick, trick question, I would say. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> go ahead. Um, the Islamic golden time, it was uh, just really amazing. And in, your in your speech, you say... The, in the modern times, the, the movement to, I don't know how to say, Saudization basically killed the, the, the arts. But before that, between the Islamic golden time, why, why such an amazing art and crafts was, was lost? Would you, what would be your opinion? I think, um, the, like, any, like any era, there are a peak and there are falls. Yes. And when you fall, you peak again. So it, it's really kind of like a movement. Uh, usually art and artists flourish when times are dark and when things got frustrated. This is where they start having a different source of expression. You can even see it in Christianity. When people were very oppressed, they started using art and architecture as a form of expression. What happened is they, it reached the peak, and people took it for granted and didn't invest much because it was great. It was flourishing. But like anything, if you don't nurture it, if you don't keep taking care of it, it will fall again. And that's what happened. It kept deteriorating until we reach bottom. Today, you look at the education system, and I can tell you from what I see with my daughter, Creativity is being killed at birth. A lot of our children are not taught for critical thinking, although by nature, why is the three-year-old stage? That's the first word, why? You can't sleep, you have to sleep now, why? You know, you need to allow for the whys. Now, um, to be very politically correct, <laughs> A lot of the uh, politically um, or the religious political movements uh, suppress creativity because we are not allowed to draw certain things in certain ways. Uh, we are not allowed to express ourselves in certain manners. So the fear killed creativity at a young age. And I can tell you one thing is that I've learned that when I was in school. I had a, a religious class that uh, said if we put, uh, I don't know if you guys remember it, but if we put pictures uh, of our family in the wall, that this is considered uh, shirk, which is like um, going against God. <laughs> and I remember in class, I stood up and I said, well, if this is the case, I think you need to go to the principal's office and remove the king's picture because he should be worshipped. And I was dismissed for three days. And I've learned to keep my mouth shut. And keeping my mouth shut, I actually lost a lot of my expression or my tools for expression. So today, we're teaching our kids to be politically correct, to respect their culture, to respect their surrounding, but to also be analytical and to also propose things and to also, I mean, um, all through my journey, I've never went against the system. I've always worked within the system, find the gaps, and made sure that I use every single gap on my benefit. Now, it happens I'm a lawyer, so I don't get in trouble, but 
but this is how change happens. I mean, you have down moments, you have up moments, and it just needs you to, to see it. So I hope I answered your question with that long answer. Yeah. Yes, you did. Um, I, I see another hand for a question. I don't want to stop you, but I do see people coming in for the next session. Uh, please hold on to your question. We'll continue this down at the, uh, the web hub. Once again, I want to thank Mr. Fana Dahnan for being here.